Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Docklands and to this morning's screening of Fire of Love, directed by Sarah Dosa. I'm Ken Jacobson, one of the programmers here at Docklands. It's great to see you all. I also want to thank Bellum Storage, Self Storage, and Boxes for their support of this screening. Um, Sarah Dosa is an award-winning producer and director. Her producing credits include Audrey and Daisy and Survivors. Her first feature as a director, The Last Season, won a Golden Gate Award, as did her previous film, The Seer and the Unseen. Fire of Love, which you're about to see, had its world premiere at this year's Sundance Film Festival, where it won the Jonathan Oppenheim Editing Award. And we are thrilled to be screening it here at Docklands. Please join me in welcoming up to the stage, Sarah Dosa, Bay Area filmmaker. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, it is such an honor to be here. Uh, as Ken said, I, I grew up here. Uh, I was born and raised in Berkeley and um, really credit the, the beauty of the Bay Area, specifically Marin County, with my uh, love of nature. When I was a kid, I spent so much time exploring Point Reyes and, and the coast, and I feel like that love of the wilds has really um, inspired my approach to filmmaking. And this is a film about the love of the earth. Um, I won't say much about it, I just hope you enjoy. Again, it's, it's such an honor to be here, and just thank you, Ken, thank you, Joni, and everyone on the Docklands team. Hope you enjoy. And we'll see you after for the Q&A. Sarah Dosa, please join me back up on stage, and congratulations on such a beautiful film. Ah, thanks so much, Ken, and thank you all for staying. Um, so, uh, I'm assuming you finished this during sort of the height of COVID, um, so probably not a lot of opportunities when you first finished it to see it in a theater. What's it been like for you to experience the beautiful images and, and incredible sound of your own film. Uh, um, you're right. We did. We made the whole film during uh, during COVID times. We began the project in July of 2020 and finished it uh, in January of this year. Um, it's been an incredible to get to see it on a big screen with audiences, um, to hear the sound, uh, uh, to see the images just kind of resplendent on a big screen. Um, so it's meant so much to have the film travel to festivals, um, especially to be at a hometown festival like Docklands. Uh, the other thing, just on a personal note, that feels so meaningful is that you know, Katya and Maurice used to show this footage around the world um, for the conferences and presentations that they would do. So it's just, it makes me so happy to think that their footage is reaching audiences again um, in settings not unlike uh, what they experienced when, when they were uh, you know, doing this 30 years ago. Absolutely. What, what is it about volcanoes and flowing lava that is just one of those things, one of those very few things that I think as human beings, it's just, it's inherently interesting. I mean, it's just, there's just something ineffable about it that is, just draws us in. What, what is it about that? Oh, I love that question. I, I could muse about that for a long time, so I'll try to keep it concise. Um, I, I think for me and, and for our team, as we were going about making the film, um, it was that the, the sheer power of them, um, the creative power as well as the destructive power, all contained in, in this force. Um, you know, the, the creative power in our film is represented most by the alluring and enchanting red volcanoes, whereas the destructive power is uh, illustrated through our, our um, depiction of gray volcanoes. Um, but the way Katya and Maurice describe them and their relationship with volcanoes, as well as many volcanologists and, and people too who have just encountered them, um, they talk about volcanoes kind of almost in kind of tropes of the divine. Um, there's something just so uh, wordless, um, so transcendent about kind of the, the sentience of that kind of force. Um, and that's something that for us as a filmmaking team, we were so just <laughs> baffled and enchanted and confused and um, just pulled so deeply in by, um, uh, by yeah, by that power. Um, and, you know, it was really the, the love that Maurice and Katya had for, for that force that drew them in to get so close to be able to capture it. Uh, but I think kind of in the same way Maurice and Katya expressed how volcanoes represented something beyond human understanding, I think for me too, that's ultimately what I land on. They represent this great mystery of the planet. 
Yeah, I think that sort of spiritual quality is captured in a, a sequence, a montage that happens just before the most destructive period where you see people throwing in offerings and it's just a whole sequence that just really captures that spiritual quality. It's beautifully done. Um, so, so Katya and Maurice were, of course, scientists, but um, they also were, you know, great communicators. And they were these sort of go-betweens between scientific discovery and public understanding. What, they were also kind of a Laurel and Hardy comedy act. <laughs> um, what was it about their sort of particular skill set, or personalities, or the times that made them kind of the, the Jacques Cousteau's of, of volcanoes? Um, I think they were so, uh, you know, they, they were just incredibly charming people. Um, they also were very savvy about their public image and knew how to perform themselves, not in a way that wasn't authentic. Um, they were genuinely, you know, Katia and Maurice when they were on camera. Um, uh, but I, I think that they really knew how to tap into their own spirit of adventure and could relay that in very accessible ways um, to wide audiences. Uh, they were very much celebrities of their time in, in France and in Switzerland and um, Western Europe during the, especially the late 70s, 80s, um, before they passed away in 1991. Um, but I, I really do think that they understood that they themselves uh, were a conduit uh, for expressing not just a love of the earth, but also a way to engage and understand it. Um, so, you know, there was very much a transformation once they experienced the devastation at Mount Ruiz in 1985, um, you know, where they kind of pivoted a little bit from being more of these kind of charming communicators of volcanoes to real activists trying to alert people about the science and the early warning signs. Um, but uh, they really kind of, their, their passion was really the fuel that, that led that communication the whole way through. One more question, and then I'll turn it over to the audience for their questions. Obviously, you kind of give away the reveal in the beginning of the film, if we didn't know it already, that, you know, that they're going to die in the end, and we can kind of figure out how, roughly, loosely, how that's going to happen. For you as the filmmaker and your team, how did you creatively come to grips with how you're going to tell the story of their demise? Um, that's a great question. It was actually very early on that we decided we wanted to tell, uh, the, you know, tell the story of their death from the beginning. Um, not necessarily say how they died or exactly when they died, but we wanted to let the audience know ahead of time that they do die. Um, and we wanted to do that for a couple reasons. One of them was that we wanted to set the clock of the film, so to speak. Um, the theme of time is big in our film, and so we wanted to create this sense that time would be, or time in a human constructed and experienced way would be running out. Um, we thought that that could kind of uh, pull into tension uh, what is meaningful, um, and specifically kind of land on this idea that, that Maurice and Katya were drawn towards um, the unknown uh, in a way, you know, they, they knew that they could never quite understand volcanoes, but pursuing the unknown, something that they loved so deeply, is was their way to live a meaningful life. And by kind of putting the death up front, we thought that that idea could kind of be crystallized early on. Uh, the other thing that it did was we wanted to make sure that the audience knew that we were telling the story of their lives through the materiality of what they left behind. And so in order to do that, we had to, um, just kind of a technical note, had to say that they passed away. And so what everyone would be experiencing was you know, their footage, their photography, their words. Um, and that in that way, we hoped it would almost mirror the process of geologic methodology. <laughs> you know, geology is, uh, one could argue, is a way of interpreting the archives of the Earth, um, you know, making sense of what's left behind through these massive Earth processes. And we kind of wanted the audience to experience Katya and Reese's story in a similar way, you know, that we were piecing together the archives they had left behind to tell a story about love and life but also that left the space open for mystery um, and kind of embrace all that we don't actually know about them because we couldn't ask them since they had passed away. Great answer, thank you. Question right here. Uh, thanks, it, this was a masterwork of editing and I'm wondering how did you tackle this project? How did you organize it and put a team? 
the question is, this is a master work of editing, and how did you organize the material, and how did you do it? Um, thank you for that question. I, I feel so lucky to have worked with two absolutely brilliant editors, um, Jocelyn Chapu, who's a local editor, she lives in Berkeley, and Erin Casper, who's an editor in New York, who um, this is actually the third film that she and I have worked on together. Uh, the three of us poured through the hundreds of hours of footage. Um, there's about 200 hours of 16 millimeter footage that Katya and Maurice shot, uh, thousands of photographs that largely Katya took, and then there was about 50 hours of archival material of Katya and Maurice on television programs and radio broadcasts, um, largely in the 70s and 80s. So those were kind of the, the main buckets that we were working from. Um, we just watched everything, cataloged everything. It was very challenging because the way that they came to us, they, they were scanned, uh, the 16 millimeter footage was scanned beautifully by the archival house in France that we worked with um, that beautifully preserved the images. Um, but there would be, the reels, for example, would have like 10 seconds of an erupting volcano, then two seconds of, say, a gas vent, and then five seconds of Katya sitting down in an inner tube. <laughs> so there is these, um, we had so many questions about how things were organized, how they were shot the way that they were. Um, and, but that actually ended up, those, those questions ended up kind of guiding our own process of inquiry. Um, that kind of led to this inquisitive narrator approach, for example, um, made us realize we needed a narrator to try to fill in some of the gaps. Uh, so even though it was a challenging process, um, there were tremendous limitations to the footage, despite how spectacular it was. Uh, each of those challenges opened up into a new creative opportunity, be it the narration or the animation. Um, so uh, <laughs> we just tried to embrace that all, and uh, the collaboration from, from my editors was enormous. And, forever grateful for, for them and their work. Right up here. On that note, um, at the end, did, how, how was the footage preserved if they were destroyed? That was one question. And the second was, this was you know pre-drawn, so there's a lot of sky footage. Is that from a uh, film company, or like from a television film company? Because more recently we have from the sky houses and the helicopter. So. So two questions. One is about the final footage of them and how that survived, uh, since they did not. And then the other is, this is pre-drone times. Can you tell, talk about the aerial footage? Who shot that? How it was shot? Yeah, um, those are great questions. The, the footage at the end um, was shot by journalists, actually, that accompanied them. There were, it was a huge media event, the mountains and eruption, and very tragically, a number of journalists actually died in the eruption alongside Katya and Maurice. Um, but uh, we licensed that footage from Japanese sources that were right up there close with Katya and Maurice and, and their cameras did survive. So, so that's how we told that story. And did um, the guy running in front of the red truck survive? Um, I don't know. I okay. believe so. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, uh, but yeah, I do believe that person survived and got out of the way. Um, but the, the, that last shot, the, that shot where he's running away, um, that was filmed, I believe, by a like news van, um, one of the you know high rising kind of poles, and, and the journalist did abandon the, that van, um, but the imagery was recovered. Um, but the aerial footage was helicopter footage. That was something, and sometimes like small plane, like Cessna type footage. Um, Captain Reese loved helicopters, uh, and they you know they were incredibly passionate about, uh, of course, their work that they did, but they had many sponsors that they worked with. Uh, they tried every way they could to fund their work in order to get enough money to, to take these helicopter rides, um, knowing how important it was to get the aerial shots, uh, not just from a scientific perspective, but from a cinematic perspective as well. So um, we had a lot of fun playing with, with those shots. In the back here. Who had the rights to all these films, and, and was it easy access for you to get all that? Who had the right? Who had the rights to all these films, and was it easy for you to get access to that? Yeah. So um, Katya and Reese's archive um, rested in an archival house named Image Est in Nancy, France. Um, the archive had changed hands through the years, um, but landed there a few years ago. Um, it was managed by these wonderful people named uh, Guillaume Poulet and Mathieu Rousseau. Uh, they worked very closely with us in terms of negotiating access specifically to the archives and the licensing process, but they also took such great care of the imagery. Um, 
uh, Bertrand Kraft, who is Maurice's brother. Uh, he was the one who gave the footage to Image Est and also had approval over the rights process. So we were very grateful for him um, to, to be on board with us um, in terms of that process of, of licensing it. Um, the actual process of negotiating wasn't all that hard. We had a non-exclusive agreement with Image Est and um, they were very easy to work with. Um, so we got very lucky <laughs> in that regard. Uh, the other footage that's in the film, um, you know, archives of Katya and Maurice on television programs and whatnot, uh, that largely came from uh, INA, which is the institute, uh, the, the national, uh, it's in French, the, it's the National Archives of France, basically. And so there's licensing agreements that, that were not hard to negotiate as well. Um, we had a fabulous archival producer named Nancy Marcotte who did all this work with us and without her skills and expertise in negotiations we wouldn't have the materials on screen, so it really was a, a huge labor of love and, and team effort to, to get all these materials. Let's try to get a couple more in, in the back. Uh, can you talk about how you came to this idea from the beginning? I mean, are you a geologist or a Question is, how did you come to this idea from the beginning, and are you a geologist? Maybe in another life, I was a, geolo a geologist, um, certainly now enthralled by geology, but uh, I first came to the footage actually um, when I was researching for the last film I directed, which is a film called The Seer and the Unseen. That film was uh, a verite film that followed an Icelandic woman who was in communication with spirits of nature. Um, and even though that film was observational, uh, we wanted to open the, the film with archives um, of Iceland, specifically archives of volcanoes, to tell kind of an allegory of, of how Iceland came to be and, and was formed. And since they were formed through volcanoes, we thought volcano footage would, would do a good job of illustrating that. So once we started researching volcano archives Iceland, we came across the story of Katya and Maurice Kraft. And the more we learned about them, the more we fell in love with them. Um, we found out that they had shot hundreds of hours of footage, just kind of tucked that in the back of our minds. Then uh, after the Sierra and the Unseen was completed, my team and I actually started a different film um, that was supposed to be shot in Siberia. Uh, however, due to the pandemic, the world closed, that project collapsed, and we were trying to figure out what we would do in the absence of not being able to shoot, and we were reminded of Katya and Marie's craft and thought we could get access to this archive, we could tell an archival story during you know, lockdown and travel the world you know, through their footage. So um, that's kind of the, the beginnings of, of how this project came to be. Yeah, um, first of all, it was amazing. What, what a really cinematic experience. Everything that a documentary can be happened in my really awesome. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was really artistic, and, it was, it, it, and I have a very much question goes in that direction. And you, have, you took a sort of an artistic license to call it a very romantic title, and to really, really go there, and really talk about love, and make animation, beautiful artistic things that are in your voice, or the voice of the makers of the film, uh, about their relationship. And um, so I was, I was wondering if you could talk about that process of taking that license, and my second part of the question is, uh, so the <clears throat> the question is first of all compliment that it's a very very artistic, and in that regard, one of the areas that you really went into was the the aspect of love, and you took a certain romantic artistic license with that. Um, if you could talk about that process, and secondly, Miranda July, who did the narration, was she involved in the writing of that? Um, first, I just have to say I love that you're wearing a red hat. <laughs> it's very Katya and Marie, so you came dressed for the occasion. Um, but yeah, we uh, I would say um, we did uh, kind of put our own artistic interpretation, of course, into the film, specifically in the narration, but it was always grounded and guided by Katya and Maurice themselves. They wrote nearly 20 books, um, largely in the first person. Um, and through their writing, there's such a bombastic, charming, kind of uh, poetic voice. They even wrote some poetry within the books that show, that just so powerfully communicated their, their love for volcanoes. Um, so that served as tremendous in inspiration for how we went about the narration. Um, we also interviewed about 15 people, uh, not on camera, because um, we, we knew from the beginning we didn't want any talking heads. We really wanted the film to be told through their own archives. But we interviewed people who knew and loved them, uh, family members as well as colleagues. 
uh, and that provided a lot of nuance and understanding about their relationship that um, escaped the visual record. And that was really important for us to, to get that um, kind of depth in terms of their dynamic as a couple. Um, so that also kind of became part of our, um, you know, the, the material for, uh, or the basis rather, for writing the narration. Um, so that, that, you know, also guided us. But there was so much that we didn't know still. Uh, kind of the more we learned about them, the more we realized we didn't know. And that, like, grand paradox that mirrors kind of the scientific process that was also the same for Katya and Reis. You know, the more they knew about volcanoes, the more they realized they, they could never fully know. Um, but we wanted to, to put our own kind of interpretation, to, to mix it in, not in a way that felt untrue, but perhaps in a way that could help to elevate what felt like the spirit of Katya and Maurice based on this research process. Um, you know, we, we really so powerfully felt their love, uh, even though, you know, we never saw, we, we didn't have any footage of them kissing or holding hands, for example. Um, but the way that they filmed volcanoes showed how desperate they were to be with volcanoes all the time. So we kind of understood volcanoes, or imagery of volcanoes, to be their love language, so to speak, and really to embrace that um, in what really felt to us like the telling of a love triangle. You know, it wasn't just Maurice and Katya that were in love, it was the volcano that was like the missing piece of this triangular relationship. So um, it became, uh, yeah, a, it wasn't concrete, but it was there. And that was the truth that we discovered. And embracing kind of different creative means, whether it's this rather whimsical uh, animation or the specific lines of narration that we wrote, um, we felt like that would kind of celebrate the love that they had, um, even if it wasn't, uh, you know, yeah, again, them kissing in, in the visual record, so to speak. And what about Miranda July? When did she come into the process? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I got a little rambly about the love question. Miranda, so she actually came aboard late in the process. Um, uh, we at first thought we wanted a French narrator, um, but uh, we, we started brainstorming, and one of my um, executive producers mentioned her, and she's a, I've just loved her work, her writing, her filmmaking, her performance art for such a long time, and I instantly was like, yes, so she would be amazing, um, not just for her performance, but so much of her own work deals in themes of existentialism, kind of the fragility of love and human relationships. She's so curious uh, and inquisitive. Um, we thought she would do a fabulous job. Um, in, in voicing the narration. Uh, she didn't do any of the writing, um, but I really feel like her delivery um, was editorial in and of itself. Um, she added such a sense of richness and vulnerability that meant so much to us. So, um, And I do actually think that there's like some words here or there that she's like, how about this? And we're like, yes. <laughs> so, um, uh, but it was myself and my two editors and one of my producers that um, were the writers on the film. So we're out of time, but um, quickly, if you can, since you're one of our own, <laughs> if I can say that, uh, as a Bay Area filmmaker, what's next for you? Um, so I don't have like an actual project next, but um, there have been a lot of themes from making this film that have been inspiring me and kind of uh, putting me on a path of inquiry. Um, I think I'm most excited to explore ideas of time and the construction of time. Um, so I'm particularly interested in uh, the story of how the international dateline, the, the very crooked line that kind of uh, sets the hegemonic understanding for time and space on our planet. Um, so I think maybe that actually might be some sort of uh, direction for, for the next project. But um, yeah, it remains to be seen. Great. Well, we can't wait to find out. And thank you and so much, Sarah. Congratulations. Well, thank you, Ken. And thank you all for being here. I also just want to say that the film's going to be out in theaters this summer, and so if you enjoyed it, um, thanks to my fabulous distributors, National Geographic Films and Neon, um, it'll, it'll be in theaters uh, this summer. So thanks so much again for coming.